No other book has so profoundly impacted so many lives as the Bible. Welcome to Simply the Bible, the Through the Bible teaching program of Pastor Daryl Zachman of Calvary Chapel, Treasure Valley. Have you ever wondered why God made the paradise of Eden and then put the forbidden fruit in the middle of the garden? Today, Pastor Daryl continues in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Hope you'll join us for Simply the Bible. Today we come to arguably God's most beautiful and mysterious creation, woman. We will also look at the origin of marriage and see what makes a good one. We pick up the story today in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God gave something to Adam to do. He was surrounded by a beautiful garden, but it needed tending. Yet in this time, before the curse of thorns and thistles and weeds, gardening would have been literally no sweat, a pleasurable pastime. God gave Adam the pick of any fruit he wanted at any time. Imagine how many different kinds of fruit were available to him. He could even eat of the tree of life and live forever. There were no restrictions except one. He must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for it would mean death to him. We may wonder why God did this. Why did God surround Adam with so many good things and then place such a bad thing in the middle of the garden? There are many aspects to being made in the image of God, including the right of free moral agency. We can choose good or evil, and God respects our decision. And there are consequences. It's been said that we make our choices and then our choices make us. God could have made us robots. We could all be programmed to worship him. I love you, God. But God didn't want a programmed response. Instead, he wanted to be loved. So how could God know if man really loved him? Jesus said in John 14, 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Our willingness to keep the Lord's commandments proves that we love him. Therefore, God gave Adam one commandment, and he would know by Adam's choice how much he loved him. For it to be a legitimate test, the alternative had to be attractive. If someone says to you, which would you rather eat, liver or ice cream? For me, that is no contest because I hate liver and I love ice cream. The alternative isn't attractive at all for me. Therefore, God made the tree of knowledge of good and evil desirable in three ways. It satisfied the hunger, it pleased the eye, and it made a person wise. But God also warned Adam that in the day that he ate of it, he would surely die. Not that he would drop dead the same day, but that death would become a certainty and he would be spiritually dead. That is separated from God. Well, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. The statement, it is not good, stands in stark contrast to the seven times in the creation account that God saw that it was good. God would make a helper for Adam who was a counterpart to him, a soulmate with some very distinct and desirable differences. Woman would be complementary to man so that together they would more completely represent the image of God. The Holy Trinity thought it needful that man also experience compound unity by the two becoming one. Now, I hear the objection from single people. Are you saying that God thinks I'm no good if I'm not married? God didn't say that. He simply said that it isn't good for man to be alone. We are social creatures, and we don't do well isolated from other people. There are many single people whom God has mightily used throughout history. 
Paul the Apostle was single and thought it was an asset because he could be undivided in his service to the Lord. Anna was a young newlywed who became a widow and served the Lord in the temple night and day until she was 84 years old. She saw the baby Jesus and spoke of him to everyone who was looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Whether you're married or single, I believe the important takeaway here is be content and have good friends. And if you're married, then make your spouse your best friend forever. Verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Now, it is interesting how God prepared Adam's heart to receive Eve. He brought every beast of the field and bird of the air to Adam to see what he would call them. God had named day, night, and earth. But when it came to the animal kingdom, God delegated this task to to Adam. After all, God had already given man dominion over all the earth. Therefore, whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Adam was newly created, and yet he was a perfect man made in the image of God. He must have had a brilliant intellect. There was, of course, a purpose for all this. As Adam took time to examine each species, male and female, he saw that they all had counterparts, and he came to the realization that he had no counterpart. Adam began to feel lonely. God prepared Adam's heart to desire the woman God was forming. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Genesis is the book of firsts. And here is the first use of anesthesia. God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam so that he could perform surgery. God took one of his ribs. The Hebrew word translated rib also means side, but Since God took one, rib is probably the best translation. God closed up the flesh. I was with someone recently in the emergency room who, after having a trampoline accident, had her shin sewn up. So I wonder how God closed up Adam's side. Maybe he simply swiped his finger across and poof, it was closed up. Who knows? Then from the rib, God made a woman. Now God formed man from the dirt but he formed woman from Adam's side. God breathed the breath of life into Adam, but Eve was the first person who received life from another person. God brought the woman to the man like the father walks his daughter to her groom. And as soon as Adam laid his eyes on her, he ecstatically exclaimed, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. English pastor Matthew Henry wrote of this. The woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Eve was most certainly beautiful. God's perfect creation, wonderfully complimentary to Adam. She is a picture of another bride. As with Adam, the sight of Jesus was opened after he died on the cross and blood and water flowed out. And from the blood that cleanses and the water of the word that sanctifies, the bride of Christ, the church, was formed. How perfectly beautiful she is in the sight of her husband how he desires to have her always by his side where he can protect and love her. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, 
and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Verse 24 is probably Moses' commentary, and Jesus quoted it to the Pharisees who thought so little of the sanctity of the marriage covenant. This is the origin of marriage, and it reveals several attributes of this God-ordained institution. First, it's conjugal. Now, that's not a word we use much, but it's a good one because it means to be joined in marriage. This has two parts, to leave and to cleave. The man must leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Only the man is mentioned here, but it applies to both husband and wife. Many marriages have been ruined because either the husband or wife was not willing to forsake parental reliance and cling to his or her spouse. This leaving also applies to other relationships with the opposite sex, certainly, whether past, present, or future. The moment you're closer to someone else of the opposite sex than you are to your spouse, you're in serious trouble. Second, it's heterosexual. In another generation, it wouldn't even be necessary to state the obvious, but we're not that generation. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and not Eve and Genevieve. Third, it's monogamous. While there would be plenty of examples of polygamous marriage in Scripture, you can never say it was God's design. One man, one woman, one flesh, till death separates. That's God's ideal. Fourth, it's intimate. Adam and Eve were both naked and were not ashamed. God created sex. He designed us to be physically attracted to our mate. I only have eyes for you. It should be the song we always sing only to our spouse. But this goes beyond mere physical intimacy because we ought to be naked with each other regarding our thoughts, feelings, desires, and dreams. Transparency in marriage is vital. Let me speak very candidly to you. In our overly sexualized culture, we must be vigilant to guard our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. We should not look lustfully at anyone who is not our spouse. Jesus said, that's adultery of the heart. We shouldn't listen to anyone of the opposite sex who tells us how wonderful we are. Flattery, it's like perfume. It's pleasant to smell, but deadly to drink. And regarding the heart, we should follow Solomon's advice in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. If you don't, then you'll give away your life to someone who doesn't deserve it, and you'll destroy the precious gift of marriage that God has given you. You are not the exception. Truly, God made a beautiful place with beautiful people in a beautiful relationship. Imagine what the world would look like today if it had remained like that. But alas, there was trouble in paradise. Join us tomorrow as we look at the fall and its tragic consequences for all humanity. You've been listening to Simply the Bible, the Through the Bible teaching program of Pastor Daryl Zachman of Calvary Chapel, Treasure Valley. They meet Sunday mornings at 1030 at Pepperidge Elementary School in Boise. To listen to any of Pastor Daryl's teachings or to find out more about the church, go to their website at calvarytv.org. That's calvarytv.org. Join Pastor Daryl tomorrow as he continues in the book of Genesis with the temptation and fall of man.